shall be moderating and looking out for your hands going up to present some points or ask some questions. So if we start with Bill, would you like to say something about yourself and, and the position you're taking? Um, hi folks, uh, I'm Bill Mitchell, I'm Director of Policy at BCS. Uh, for many years I was an academic at various different universities, Manchester University, um, Surrey University, uh, briefly at Southampton University, worked at Mofrola for a number of years there in their European research labs. Um, I'm not actually going to tell you what ethics is at all, I'm just going to talk about why it's so darned hard um, and all of the difficulties there are in trying to implement that in industry and, and how we can possibly support the universities who are trying to now teach AI, AI and machine learning courses in particular to embed ethical practice across the curricula. So I don't actually have a particular uh, position about ethics. I am aware of the fact that there are now more than 80 different ethical frameworks purely for AI across the globe. So pick the one you like, really. Thank you. Can I just speak loudly? I, I think it's being no, recorded. because it's being recorded. Oh, okay. And, um, um, okay. Um, in 1988, I published a book on the ethics of AI and recommended a code. Uh, and the, the main theme I pushed back in the 1980s, it was 1986 when I wrote it, was self-regulation. And But now, as a cynical old man, I feel the industry's had time to self-regulate and has failed miserably. In fact, standards in IT, ethical standards in IT, have just moved steadily downwards over that period. Uh, I, what would I like to see? I, if you want me to define ethics, happy, but it will take an hour at least. So it, it's a rabbit hole, perhaps best avoided. But immediately, I think it's, it's obviously anomalous that we're going to accept autonomous vehicles on our streets. And although if a human has to drive a car, they need to be licensed. There's a minimum standard of competence. The AI programmers who program those autonomous vehicles need to meet no standards whatsoever. Right? <clears throat> the best you can hope is that the software is being produced by a gifted amateur. Right? The same applies in medical care. I have a vision of the future where a, a doctor, licensed by the General Medical Council, done plenty of ethics with me, <laughs> eight years training, fully responsible, is taking advice from a handheld device that's wirelessly interfering interfacing with the sensors on the bed, recommending a teach treatment program, and this is not science fiction, this is already in use. It's already in use with children at Alderhey. I, I suppose you all know that IBM commercialized their Watson program that won Jeopardy as Dr. Watson, and we should have seen that name coming, shouldn't we? Um, uh, and again, so they're taking medical advice from software produced by a gifted amateur. And some of my colleagues would even take away the word gifted there, right? No licensing at all. Uh, anything goes wrong because there's an extra zero, and which could cause fatalities. I mean, if I, I'll be more daring. Will cause fatalities, right? It, 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 this one's easy to predict. The programmers, and maybe it's wrong to blame the programmers here. A lot of the fault comes down to their management who've made them develop uh, an application on a ridiculously short time scale and, and uh, there must be people in the room who know that, uh, that in current practice software is not tested properly. Uh, in, in fact, here's, here's another example going back to the autonomous vehicles. Uh, I don't know how many of you came here by Tesla, but uh, Tesla have an autopilot program for their car which up to updates overnight whether you like it or not. Uh, it asks you to consent to use it because it's beta software. It's not properly tested. Now, I'm so old, I can remember when users were asked whether or not they'd use a beta version of a word processor or a mail sorter, right? uh, and they gave their permission. But now, as I say, standards have deteriorated. Now, you know, even, even operating systems are really beta versions. You, you have a, a crash. You phone up about it and they say, oh, it'll be fixed in service pack two. Uh, and I honestly don't think expecting people to use beta software in an autonomous vehicle is, is ethical. You know, um, have I said enough, Penny? Yes, you've got your I, I, mean, I mean, I could go on, but I, I could go on. We really do need better standards. And credit to the BCS for trying to get this, but uh, I would add as a codicil, it needs to be worldwide because it's no good you using software from 
at certain large tech companies in the Palo Alto area who have even lower ethical standards than are common in London. Okay, my name is Bernd Stahl. I'm a professor at De Montfort University. I'm the last one there. I may not quite look like that anymore, uh, but it is me. Um, so I lead a research group uh, at De Montfort University, which is called the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility. And we're now pretty much exactly 25 years old, so I think it was in April uh, 1995 that we had our first Ethicom conference. Uh, so we're not quite as long run as, as Blay, but well, good for a uh, good while. Um, one of the things um, that I do at the moment is I coordinate a European research project called Sherpa that looks at the ethical and human rights aspects of AI and big data. And at least one person in the room was here when we tested our guidelines last week. So one of the 80 uh, comes from us. It might, it might be uh, number 81. Um, two points I would say in, in this opening statement that may be of interest uh, for the discussion. One has to do with the categorization of ethical issues. So what are the ethical issues coming out of AI or related to AI? Um, so in the Sherpa project, we've done lots of different things and we've come up with a long list of more than 40 ethical issues. But I think you could probably categorize them in three main groups. One is, these are special, uh, specific issues linked to machine learning. So these are uh, issues related to the fact that uh, machine learning is opaque, that we find it difficult to or impossible to understand. So there are things like uh, transparency, algorithmic biases that are specific to machine learning. The second point that we make when we talk about ethics of AI is about how societies use emerging technologies to organize themselves. So there's a lot of worry about how modern societies progress, and uh, those are things like, for example, power imbalance between big internet companies and the individual consumers, uh, economic issues, uh, unemployment, uh, impact on democracy, Cambridge Analytica, that sort of stuff. So there's a, uh, these are more political issues, and they're not specific to machine learning, but they fall under the current disc uh, discourse around ethics of AI. And the third one, then, are what I would call metaphysical issues. These are questions around uh, the possibility of uh, machine consciousness, super intelligence, the singularity, and so on, uh, which in practice uh, are at this point difficult to observe, but they take uh, a lot of attention in the public and media discourse. So the point here is that these are three completely and fundamentally different types of issues, uh, but they all are discussed under the heading of ethics of AI, and that's <coughs> one of the problems why it's very difficult to, to get a handle on how to deal with them. Now, the second point I would make is that in order to address ethics of AI in all of those three areas, I think what is required is a sort of ecosystem of responsible AI or an ecosystem of AI for human flourishing. And that has to be local, but also global. It has to cover companies. It has to cover universities. Uh, and that's, I think, where the BCS and other professional bodies have an important role to play to facilitate discussions between different types of stakeholders, because none of those 80 guidelines or sets of codes will be able to sort the problem, but I think across them they may well be able to do that. But for that we need to develop this ecosystem and I think the interesting question is how can that be established? Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone back to Joe. Do you want to, you, you've got some slides. Um. Yes, do you want me to actually go through the take it? Great, yeah. okay, fine. Um, so I, I said I'd, I'd show you why is this problem hard um, and I was also asked to explain the work that we are starting to do as BCS in collaboration with the government's independent centre for data ethics innovation. Uh, oh, look, it works. Um, so, uh, currently ongoing, it's very much in its early days, uh, BCS, as I say, is working with CDEI. Uh, we're looking at trying to develop some practical guidance that we can offer to universities about embedding ethical practice throughout their curriculum. Where has this come from? Uh, so, going back about a year, uh, the Office for AI commissioned the BCS to look at how we can uh, or rather how the university sector can design MSc courses in machine learning and data science that are going to meet the uh, UK PLC industrial needs. So we did a lot of work in consultation with lots of employers and lots of universities and we produced a very big fat report uh, which uh, they were very keen on and this is a uh, just a quote from a PR release from the, the government which explains that actually we did great work and our report was really good. Lovely. Uh, what was the report? So what was really interesting so without prompting, you know, we genuinely interact with a lot of employers, and the biggest thing they said, and so this is the very high-level view, okay, there's lots of detail behind this, but the high-level view from all the employers was, we need diverse teams, we need interdisciplinary teams, and we need them to be ethical. We need them to be able to ethically do the science, to do the engineering, and to do the business side. 
that's what we need. And that's what came from those employers. I was really intrigued that that was the way they explained what they were trying to get to. Uh, so our report sort of goes into that in more detail and tries to you know, unpick the different aspects of what the science of engineering and management is. And at the end of the report, we said, okay, so we, we can give you an overview of what the employers are actually looking for from the kind of MSc courses that they would like. Um, and this is the very, very high level view of it. So the idea is that out of these MSc courses, you're going to get ethical people who are competent and talented. Um, if you're going to do that, then you need to make sure that those people, if they're going to be valuable within industry, then they get lots of work-related experience. Perfect world, they'd go on a placement. That's not going to happen because it's too hard to generate 3,000 placements a year. So in the report, we talked about work-related experience. However, the point about that was that the employers were really clear what they would desire most of all is to see that work-related experience assessed and evidenced against both professional and ethical standards. And again, I thought that was really interesting. Um, what that means is that you need to have uh, ethical and professional practice embedded throughout the curricula. In many instances, what we've seen in undergraduate degrees is that ethical practice is tacked on as a separate module. Now, that would not meet the requirements that we were getting from the employers who wanted to see ethical practice embedded right across everything that goes on in the course. Um, and of course, as an input to all of this, you need to somehow be able to recruit a diverse range of students, not just very, very clever white males who've done maths for maths and physics, but very, very clever white people who are women, uh, who are uh, from uh, different ethnic, eth God, I can never say the word, <laughs> ethnic minorities. Sorry, that's my comprehensive education. Um, and you need that diverse input into those MSc courses if you're going to get the right outputs at the other end. So I've just given you two slides, the overview of the 100-page report that we wrote for them. So what came out of that very, very strongly was, well, what are these ethics people talking about? So, okay, great, there are 80 different ethical frameworks. Does anybody use them? Does anybody care? Um, so what we actually started looking at is um, how we would provide guidance that's going to cover the product life cycle of AI systems, whichever of those ethical frameworks you think is going to be appropriate. So that's going from design to development through to adoption. And when we started unpicking, and we've had a lot of support from IBM, they've been fantastic on this because they've got a lot of experience over data ethics. And of course, that is hugely relevant to AI. There's this lovely diagram in one of their papers which shows you why this is complicated. At the beginning, I said employers want interdisciplinary teams. Well, that's where the problems are. The problems are that what you want that's ethical occurs within what you can do legally, which is not necessarily what the company wants to do. The company might want to do things which, do you know what? They're not legal. Oh, oops. Uh, there's a load of things you might want to do technically, which, oh gosh, not all of those are legal either. And actually, not all of those meet your business requirements. Ah. Um, and within all of that, there is there's something called ethical. So the problem is you've got these interdisciplinary teams who go across marketing, sales, advertising, product development, after sales service, and all of those teams work across different parts of this, but there is a blurring of boundaries and governance and responsibility which can lead inadvertently to ethical issues. Um, so it's not just about having the principles. The principles are lovely. Pick one of the 80 ones you like, go for it, smash in. That's not the job done. Neither is the job done to think, I'm really good at coding, so I can build technical solutions to this. Lovely. The problem, the really difficult stuff, the grey area where it all gets a bit messy, um, is when you start having to talk to the different business managers, the engineers, the legal departments, etc., etc., and getting them collectively to take the right kind of governance and ownership and control of this whole problem for making it work. And just to finish to show that we did actually think about AI, this isn't just about data, what we've decided to do for our study in terms of looking at where does it really get difficult? Where is it really hard? Because that's the stuff where it's interesting. We decided that for our study from now on, what we're going to restrict ourselves to is the kind of AI systems which are highly automated. Because if actually it's something that's got lots and lots and lots of manual intervention involved, you're not really going to get that much in terms of difficult, interesting ethical problems because basically you've got a bunch of human beings there who can sort it all out for you. Um, it's going to get really interesting when you've got AI systems that react to real-time data because then there is no chance of sitting down and carefully considering what might or might not be going on. You 
got to rely on the system. Um, the AI systems that cause you the most interesting problem is where they are probabilistic and self-learning um, that inform decisions that are going to have consequences for people. Because after all, if it's not going to have a consequence for a person, there's no problem. So don't bother with them. Um, future to jump. If it's difficult to actually figure out what the hell the thing is doing, guess what? That's going to be interesting ethically. If it's difficult to then contest whether it was doing the right thing, lovely from an ethical point of view, really interesting. Um, and finally, I think what makes it interesting is where you're looking at where what we're really saying is we're using AI systems to semi-automate human judgment. That makes it interesting. So that's what we're now actually trying to do. We've had some interesting stakeholder meetings. We're getting a lot of support from the Office of AI, the Office for Students, uh, from the Institute of Coding, so we're working with all of those people. And at the moment, it's early stages. This is pretty much summarising where we've got to. Over the next few months, we're going to be going out talking to more universities and employers to try and figure out how we can unpick all of that and provide guidance to universities about, you know, you've got an MSc course on data science and machine learning. How can we support you to take on those challenges and understand how to uh, unpick all of that and build it within your curriculum? Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, so, Cecilia, you're going to be to say something uh, about what you've heard so far or uh, raise a question. Uh, one at the back and then thank you. Okay, I might have to... Well, you mentioned data science. Uh, so it, it is different because I think what people are most interested in there is the uh, generation, uh, sharing, curation, provenance of the data. So it's a lot of engineering things, it's a lot of legal concerns, it's a lot of governance concerns which are um, separate to the actual computing part. The computing part to some extent is to do with the technology that enables all of that as opposed to the outcome of what you're trying to do. So I think the data science part in principle, you could do it all, if you had enough of them, lots of very clever people who are sitting there doing all of the, the data part for you. You don't actually need the technology. Computer science, I think, is where you're automating all that through the technology. Actually, can I just say some things that, that might help clear this up technically? Um, we're talking about AI glibly, but modern AI isn't all the research AI that was going on in the 80s and 90s. Modern AI is almost exclusively machine learning. And the, the glib way to describe machine learning is it's just a set of pattern matching algorithms. But what gives it its power is massive data sets, astronomically large data sets. When we were training neural nets on 200 examples back in the 90s, the results weren't anything like so interesting. But now we can train them on millions. And when people say, well, is the power in the data or in the algorithm? Well, it's, it's in the combination of both. You, you've got to realize the, um, how is it that uh, an AI system can be better at diagnosing tumours than a human specialist? Well, a human specialist might see, what, 10,000 x-rays in, in a career. An AI system can see 10 million in, in minutes. So it, even the dumbest algorithm would get good with that data. So you can't really separate the data from the algorithm in describing the power of these systems. It, does that help? Yeah, there is one. There, oh, sorry. The, the, um, uh, sorry, do you want to? No. Um, one, one comment there about the medical diagnosis thing. There seems to be some evidence lately that um, neural networks in particular are very good at identifying common cases because the kind of probabilistic reasoning tends to conform to the norm. And it's not so good at doing the exception cases, which possibly yeah. an experienced physician might be good at. One, well, one can hope. <laughs> yeah, it depends if you're paying for boof or not, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was struck. Um, you were saying there that this is uh, that the, your work is driven by uh, the feedback from what business needs, and I I actually question that because I, I don't see at board level a true 
understanding or maturity of what the new tools and technologies are generally capable of and the obligations that accompany them uh, because it's a new level of ethical <coughs> practice that is required now and I don't think that's in the boardroom quite yet I think there's a very attracted by very shiny objects that give greater productivity profitability all the benefits without actually giving due care and consideration about what are the extra obligations that accompany uh, using those tools and techniques. So I'd be, I'd be curious to find out in terms of the scoping and specification that you're receiving from business, is that coming from really kind of that level? Uh, so it's, it's, it's from senior managers, but it's not from boardroom level. And uh, without naming any particular organisations, I, I think there is a level of concern from the senior technology people and the people on the business side who are not at boardroom that potentially there's a little bit of magical thinking going on in certain boardrooms that shouldn't be. And there is certainly concerns in some of the technical senior managers that they are providing services to clients where the client's boardroom definitely is suffering from magical thinking. And they are concerned for the reputation of their own corporate entities that they're, they are providing those clients with new, fancy, wonderful machine learning technology that they don't really know quite how to use. And particularly, they don't know how to create the right kind of data inputs to those systems, which is going to badly reflect on them, of course, afterwards. Could I quickly say something about um, also the, the requirements we have here? Uh, I think there is a strong case we made that uh, if you see those requirements, the ethical decision should be, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just by the very nature of how this is constructed, because it is autonomous, there is no human interaction, they make decisions that have significant uh, consequences for humans. That's exactly the point where you say, no, AI shouldn't do it. Um, so, so I think that there's an interesting question of how, how this was constructed and, and why this is perceived to be a good way of, of dealing with it. Rather than taking AI as a support for humans, to, as a decision support system, you say, well, actually, AI, AI makes its own decision. Uh, we are all happy with a radiologist who uses an AI to better diag diagnose the cancer cells, but we're all unhappy, at least, and, and I think many other people are, uh, if the AI makes those decisions by itself. And I think that there's, it might still be the exact same system that does the exact same thing, but the way it's framed and the way it's used makes all the difference in the world in terms of ethics. Automation yes. And I think you're absolutely right. And the, the question from an ethical point of view, so how do you, what steps do you do to move back from that to get it to the point where it is ethical? So how much does it then become automated? How much uh, do you uh, identify where the probabilistic side is coming into it? How, how do you change it so it can be contested and things like that? So I, I, I totally agree. So this isn't meant to be what you should implement. This is when you've got lots of red flags flying and you go, whoa, what's going on here? We need to fix this. This isn't right. Yeah, totally agree. I, I, actually. I have a worry with one particular use case then, which is driverless cars or self-driving vehicles, mm. which which are coming. Um, the government have decided that they're coming, and um, I, I'm actually on the all-party parliamentary advisory group on AI, and I can tell you why the government want to do this. And it is, it, yes, it's not a it's not for a particularly ethical reason, but um, here's a here's a case where we're handing over control to an AI completely. And it will be probabilistic and difficult to determine responsibility. Um, actually, while I've got the microphone, I'll throw out a technical point. Um, I, because <coughs> Bernd said difficult or even impossible to work out why a neural net's done what it's done. I don't like the impossible. I think a suitably technically trained team of people can unpack a, a neural net. It, 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 it's not going to be easy, and it's not a job for a lawyer or an insurance agent, it's a job for techie people, but uh, I, I think it could be done in the event of an accident. And they'd have to be able to ask technical questions of the people who built it. In particular, how did you test it? How long did you test it? Show me the test data. No, show me the real test data. But given all those things, I think it is possible to work out why an AI has done what it is. But, it, but it's a technical challenge. And, and I, I don't see anybody rising to that technical challenge. Um, I just want to start there. There's a question in the uh, video from Martin Paul. Right, very much. Um, yeah, I want to, uh, I was quite intrigued by the Venn diagram that you put across the yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs>
And what struck me was how hard it is to define what is and what is inevitable. Mm. Um, and I'll take the example of the self-driving car, leaving aside whether it runs somebody over or not, even if it works absolutely perfectly. If you work on a, a self-driving car system and you put a hundred thousand Uber drivers out to work, they're going to think that's not very moral or ethical or what have you. You know, lorry drivers mm. across the world will be put out of business by these fleets of trucks that keep disappearing. If you work CF and other organisations are, are they helping to define what is ethical versus what you do about it and we're assuming that somebody else is going to define what is or is not ethical. So I think that's really the, the number of the problem in many ways. It's not the technology. As, as Dr. Kings Whitby has said, you know, technology, we can deal with that, but ethics is, is really hard. Ma'am? Uh, so that's a really, really interesting question. So for, for, to start with, it's I think it's extremely interesting to, to decide whether it is an ethical question whether uh, people's jobs are going to disappear because of automation, which has been going on for a long time. It was very interesting when we responded to the European Union's uh, initial draft framework around AI, where we felt that they had blurred lines between what you would really say are ethical principles together with political considerations. So I think it's very legitimate to raise as an issue that politically, as a society, we need to decide whether we want people's jobs to be automated out of existence or not, and think about it. Whether that is an ethical issue, I'm not actually sure. It's an important issue, and we all need to come to a consensus and understand what the heck is going on and who's going to be affected and try and support those people. But I'm not absolutely clear that is in fact an ethical problem as opposed to a political problem. Um, in terms of trying to shape the agenda, one of the things that we have to be careful about as a professional body is that um, one of our most important roles is helping people to get together and form a consensus about what's going on and to understand what the issues are and what the impact and uh, significance is going to be for them and then to decide how we collectively as a society do something about that. So it's, I don't think the BCS as a professional body should be deciding whether we're going to make lots of people employed or not. What we should be doing is making sure that everybody is properly informed, properly understands the issues, properly understand what's likely to happen in terms of what, what the consequences are, understand the unintended consequences, and then come to a properly thought through position, which we can all agree is the one we want to get to. Actually, can I just say one factual thing, just in case people in the room don't know it. Um, uh, uh, a few years ago, a petition signed by a number of people in the field, I'll admit to it, and I'm pretty sure Bernd signed it too, went to the United Nations saying, we need a, a worldwide moratorium on uh, aut autonomous aerial vehicles having the capability to deploy lethal force. In other words, killer drones. And the UN had chewed over this in Geneva uh, for several years. And as I understand it, the, the debate has founded on definitions of autonomy and so on, so, um, and it's unlikely that there will be a worldwide moratorium, but just so you know, I, I'm completely opposed to that. Did you, did, did you want to say anything, Bill? Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the report you're describing, without having checked it, seems to cover our responsibility in the Charter to provide advice that we think is relevant and when you talked earlier on about this being a professional issue, what does the BC, is the BCS going to do anything to support the people who come out of having been gone through a curriculum that says this is this is ethical, this isn't? Then they go into work and they form an opinion. Mm. Are we? them to meet some kind of ethical stance on what they perceive they're being asked to do and what would the BCS do in terms of a code of conduct and to support them? Um, that, that 
is such an interesting question. Uh, we haven't thought it through properly around the MSc course, to be honest. At the moment, what we're doing is, is trying to identify how we can support universities to put in, in place that um, ethical practice throughout the curriculum. Um, what we can do, I think, is, is act as a community of practice so that we bring people together who can support one another and help them develop the kind of practice. What we want to be able to do is help people to be able to professionally dissent within their workplace if mm. things aren't working properly. It's pretty obvious we can't dictate to companies what they're going to do or not do. What I think we can usefully try and do and work to do is to change corporate culture. And we can do that through our membership and through collaborating with government and the wider stakeholders in society. How successful we're going to be over that, I, I don't know. Um, a kind of an obvious example we might mention is so how good are we at persuading Facebook to take a different stance over <laughs> the way they behave, say. And clearly, when some, a company like that is able to just shrug off a $5 billion fine, um, it's difficult to imagine quite how you could have leverage over what's actually going to happen in the workplace. So it's a really, really tough challenge. Can I put something on your agenda then? Go on then. Penny will remember, years ago, the BCS Ethics Committee, we discussed having a hotline that, oh, pe yeah, that yeah, people yeah. could phone the BCS with ethical questions. And we were told <coughs> it's too risky legally and insurance-wise. Mm -hmm. But I think that would be that would be a direct contribution that BCS could make to people in practice, just giving them a phone number to, to speak to someone and discuss the issue. And I'm happy to volunteer for free. Interesting. I asked it because after the presenting of the paper at one of your United Ethics conference, the academics, with the audience, I think we're all academics, and they asked me, so have you ever been asked what your ethical position is when you've been applying for a job? And I said, no. no. <laughs> I've never even been asked if I'm a member of the BCS. So um, I think we need to be practical and open about whether or not, uh, the, really, the degree to which we're calling this professional and the degree to which we're saying to be a member of the BCS says this about you and the BCS is a kind of BMA has an ethics hotline. It's not a new idea. Can I just ask a question, please? And I want to ask you, Penny, so why do we have the BCS ethics group? What is the objective that it can bring into this? Okay, so uh, the BCS ethics uh, session, ethics group uh, came about um, from the uh, BCS ethics committee. Um, the committee was around people um, from industry and academia and um, thinking about the issues that, that face this um, industry, if you like. Um, from that, uh, it was suggested that there should be a, a group that goes from to the general BCS membership um, to uh, actually, you know, get their ideas, opinions, um, and, and spread sort of ethics beyond our little 16-numbered committee to the wider membership. And so uh, the SG was formed, um, I can't remember the date of that. Shortly after the specialist group was formed, the BCS uh, disbanded the smaller committee. And to be, personally, I think it was a real shame to say so because there were People in that committee who came up with some interesting questions and ideas that then would have provided a foundation to, to put out to the general membership. But that's where we are now. The specialist group, uh, I believe, has um, got, I don't know, 500, 800 members, mostly in the UK, but some around the world. Um, and the, the, it, uh, the idea behind it, our ob objectives are to raise awareness of ethics, provide um, hopefully useful informational tools um, to be able to do the job and um, uh, try and engage the membership to um, join in the discussions. So mostly that has been in the form of meetings here in London 
everything comes in a base, and um, specialist groups are necessarily run in base. So we usually have lots of contact with people, sort of face to face contact um, that could be useful uh, and is a much better way of doing things as well. Um, So a bit of a cop-out. I mean, I think our role is facilitating the discussions between the different stakeholders, between the universities, the employers and government, and getting them to actually have sensible conversations where they're focused on what, what the impact of this is societally and, and how to deal, to deal with it. I think that's our role. And that's going to be an ongoing role, as you say, because these things will, will shift constantly. Um, the other thing that's not really included here is social acceptance of various risks, because socially, people, once they get familiar with technology and they get used to its impact, they change their own behaviour in light of the technology. So whereas once upon a time, we would have all thought it was absolutely terrifying to have a speaker in our home that constantly monitored what we said. Apparently, it's fine now, and we all like it because we can buy more stuff. That's great. both using the same technology stack, they're both using machine learning, and one of them is using a, a, for a surveillance capability, and interestingly, they've centralised their ethical operations centre, and you go to that to see that you're doing the right job. The scale-up company believe and have embedded um, ethical practices as a personal responsibility for every single employee in the company. Now, part of that onboarding is, you know, the unconscious bias. How do you work with other team members in developing technology solutions, knowing what your approach to that is? Like everybody's going to be slightly different, but understanding how you work with with colleagues, so you've got a different view of the world, and you know, you're going to arrive at something really robust. That's their approach. They're very quite over. It's almost like if someone centralised it all, and someone said it's all of our responsibility. This is a common value that we're trying to address here. And all of the engineers have in this in the scale up company, they've all been um, you know been invested in, in terms of there's a course of Orgonauts, it's covered called Ethical Intelligence Associates, so I, I recommend it to you. And and there's three basic sort of prisms to look through about having a constructive conversation with technology colleagues about if we build it. This is what it can do. This is what are the unintended consequences as well. And it kind of baselines those conversations. So um, there's some really amazing stuff that's going on out there, some really highly ethical practices in some of our scale up companies and the big institutions as well. They're just approaching it from a different, slightly different angle. Can I quickly ask whether you have a view on which approach works best, or is it we've got to wait and see? I, I think. It's a, it's a function of scale. I don't think they like that either. 
but it might just be a function of how you communicate. But the companies in the future, the companies that are going to you know, be doing a really good job for the economy, are going to be massive companies in the future. You know, they're not, not going to need 1,200 or 1,000 developers. They're going to be boutiques at scale. So a high end of scale up is the one to watch for this growth. But they're all programmers, they're all technologists, they've learned about ethics, they've invested that as a new tool for their professional practice. It's out there for Um, I, I, I see the ethics issue, uh, well, I, I see one fundamental uh, issue or conflict, which is the, the conflict between computing capability and the ethics. Uh, basically, the, I, I think the computers, uh, the computing computer, uh, com uh, capability increases exponentially. Now, there are, there are several phenomena. Why that uh, for, for people who legislate, Sometimes they take away variables from the input, like racial background or some, some contentious ones. That, that's to, uh, I call it handicap, the, the computing capability. Uh, and the second thing that, um, uh, say, what, what's called in, interpretable e machine learning, uh, say, to, to advocate, to form the, the rules into logics that's understandable by human beings. Uh, in a sense, that's to reduce the dimension of data. And I, I call it also handicap the, the uh, computing capability. Now, but on, on the other hand, you know, with, with the quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the capability increases exponentially. Um, if we unshackle it, if we fully unshackle it, we, we would have like Google, uh, you know, running experiments with uh, 10, between 10 and 20 million dollars. And that's almost the, the life expenses of 20 adults. You know, you, you take them from birth to death, that's the total life expenses of raising 20 human beings. And, and there, there is politically, there's a strong undercurrent that, uh, you know, the, 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 the governments or the elites, you know, they want to dismantle the nation state's boundary and go into alliance with whoever has power and, uh, and money. Because if we unshackle the computing power, and that's, that's uh, I think, one strong tendency for the governments to do that if there is no strong legal and governmental systems. Uh, so all, all this is um, the, the, the problems, as I see, around the ethics. Can you take that? <coughs> so I'm going to be a, a cheeky. What's the question? <laughs> uh, the, the question is, how do you see about the fundamental <coughs> conflict between computing, computing capability and ethics. Okay, so this is and, a and little how bit do you, yeah, uh, on the so community level. So it's the con concentration level. of computing power in the hands of the few. Is that the question? Oh, sorry. The concentration of massive computing resources in the hands of the few, rather than. In yeah, the and, and also, the kind of well, when when you have, you know, ex exponential level of computing power, it's impossible to check for a human being or for a group of human being to check. Uh, whether the system is doing the right thing or not, because it can it can compute in, compute results for exponential number of cases. Only quantum computer can check quantum computer. Humans cannot check it, and that's a tendency. So the, the the glib answer would be to say you have to design the system to start with, so that it has to be able to justify what's actually going on. The difficulty there, though, is that you're possibly going to completely cripple the system to become not terribly clever because what machine learning systems do, I mean, this is the example recently that was published in Nature where they've been looking through different possible new antibiotics and the machine learning algorithm was looking at things that humans just totally couldn't have done. So there's no way a human in advance could have built in sa potential safeguards into that kind of machine learning algorithm because it had to be allowed to run free in order to discover brand new things that nobody had ever thought of. So it's actually quite tricky to decide how you can build in what lots of people call explainability um, into these systems without actually stopping them doing the invention, because the invention is the bit you're trying to get to. And there are huge social issues around building massively powerful systems that you don't actually control. 
and that even the people that build them don't control it. We've already got that now. We've had flash crashes on, on the financial markets, which have had nothing to do with machine learning, just from completely incomprehensible technology that's been implemented by people who didn't understand what it was doing. And you've had massive uh, issues around concurrency and parallelism in those circumstances, which is similar to what you're talking about with quantum computing, which have caused potentially hugely damaging effects to the economy. Um, so this is a massive area that needs to be looked at, but it's incredibly hard to figure out how you can have the right technical solution, because as you rightly say, technically, you cannot verify these systems. It's not theoretically possible. To, sorry to throw out the thing that people always do throw out, you know, the Turing test, you know, sorry, the Turing and decidability comes in for machine learning just as it does for deterministic algorithms. So the, the question for us as a society is how much you limit these technologies so that they can actually be properly verified and when do you need to do that? And I suspect a lot of the questions actually come back to what the people are trying to achieve with those systems. If you look at facial recognition or if you look at using these systems to decide whether somebody's going to re-offend or not, there are underlying moral issues which are before you ever get to the technology that we're allowing to creep into the technology that should have been solved before we ever start thinking about it. So I'm hogging the microphone, so I'm going to hand it over. Uh, a couple of quick points. Um, one, it's not that good yet. Don't, don't be fooled by the science fiction. I mean, AI is good in narrow areas at the moment, but it's not that good. I've got a colleague, Winfried uh, Hensinger at Sussex. He's got three quantum machines working in the lab just across the road from my office. He's a, a passionate advocate for the technology and a complete optimist. He says 10 years. Right? So I think 10 years is the minimum before we're going to have to worry about using quantum computing. And that's going to be interesting. Um, in fact, tear up your password security before <laughs> 10 years later, um, because it's just not going to work anymore. Um, my personal view, to take an ethical standpoint, is it's almost my definition of decadence if a, if a society uses technology that it doesn't understand. That's just decadence. And some of this technology is hard to understand. I, d I don't deny it. You know, making explainable AI systems is difficult, but I would say, to an extent, as humans, you've got to step up, technically, right? You know, you don't say, oh, you know, it's wonderful, but I don't understand it. No, learn. Um, and sooner or later, some people are going to have to learn. I mean, it, it, I'll take another use case from another area that I'm interested in, which is uh, aviation, right? Since 2000, all Airbus airliners have been fly-by-wire. Essentially, the computer, or a bank of five computers, so you can take a majority opinion, fly the aircraft. Uh, the pilot has a little computer joystick to play with, but it's psychodrama, right? <laughs> um, because the computer can override the pilot's input. Yeah, the difference between, sorry to interrupt, the difference between aviation and computer in general computer is that aviation is programmed, it, it's strictly controlled and checked. Every component, you know, how they link together, what can happen on the different scenarios, that the system was engineered in that way. But I, I just meant, I, I don't deny what you say, but I just meant that there is this fundamental conflict. Well, it, well, maybe, but I, but I would just simply say to the industry, but match, your, match aviation standards. It can be done. I, actually, the point I was going to make about the Airbus was uh, they thought pilots could just be trained to fly it. Remember, the computer, the pilot can go, we go up now, and the computer says no, right? <laughs> The computer can override the pilot, but the pilot can't override the computer. That's the relationship there. But it has been found necessary in these 20 years as a result of aviation accidents to train all Airbus pilots so they have to memorize a block diagram of the software. They've actually got to know a functional account of the software because uh, that's the only way they can fly the aircraft safely. And I think, you know, you couldn't do that for your iPhone, could you? Uh, but that's decadence. I mean, really, people have to stand up and start understanding the software and, and not saying, oh, no, you know, Google have told me it's too hard to understand. I mean, yeah, it's hard to understand, but someone, someone's got to do it. Oh, do you want to say anything there? Well, I, I, I thought there's some really good comments about sort of the singularity and about uh, about sort of the, uh, the change management aspect of AI. Uh, my, my experience is very narrow. It's in healthcare using AI. 
And there I think we have a very strong ethical framework. Uh, our starting point has always been patient safety, product safety, and privacy. And if you build out from that, there's uh, issues around traceability and accountability that underpin the FDA's guidelines. Uh, it provides a very strong framework and things like uh, absence of bias, um, uh, it, it's built into any assessment you will make of an AI system in healthcare. Um, so I, I think if I look at the, the diagram there, what can be done technically in terms of what we do with AI in healthcare is we're saying, well, we're, we're stuck with a solid ethical position. And I would say it's also a solid line for the legal position with, with 21 CFR Part 11 and the GDPR. But what can be done technically has to match what we can do in the ethical thing. And we're trying to push the framework all the time. And we're asking ourselves, well, can we have reproducibility? And the thing I'm always asking my colleagues is, is can we reproduce this? Uh, can we provide evidence of how we got there, what the decision making was? Do we have privacy, safety, and security by design built into our AI <coughs> framework? So I, I'm not claiming that healthcare's got it all sorted. You mentioned the BMA. Um, I think there's a lot, the ethical committees are quite uh, commonplace in healthcare. But I do think we do have a way of reconciling what can be technically possible, what the legal requirements are, and what the ethical position is in a very concrete way in healthcare. Okay, um, I, I, I of course agree with what, everything you said, um, but I'm also with another hat on, uh, I'm the ethics director of the Human Brain Project, which is a big European flagship project where we're spending 500 million euros on building an ICT infrastructure for neuroscience. Um, and that has a strong medical component to it. Um, and, and one of the interesting things is that, yes, in, in medicine you have these existing ethical frameworks, you, know, you have the biomedical ethical research principles and so on. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are no ethical issues. So for example, in uh, our research, one of the activities that's happening is that people are trying to identify biomarkers for certain neurological diseases. Right? Um, and then when you find those, you may have found them, but it doesn't really mean you understand what they mean. So all of a sudden you have a description of a bit of the brain, which allows you to predict that somebody is going to have something, you know, get Alzheimer or depression or whatever else it might be. And uh, it has been pointed out that that raises all sorts of different ethical issues. Uh, for example, about the role of the doctor. Uh, all of, you, so you move from symptom-based diagnosis to biomarker-based diagnosis, where all of a sudden the expertise of the doctor changes, which the doctor may or may not like. Uh, it, it, it means that the perception of diseases changes. Uh, it also changes the way we see ourselves. You know, are we um, full rounded persons, or are we just functions of what our brain does? The point I'm trying to make here is that the, the ethical consequences of the use of technology are not necessarily just limited to what we think about ethics in the first place, but there may be much more complicated follow-on uh, later issues that should be, or that may be worth considering, but which we may not be aware at the point where we're doing it. Isn't the question there, though, that we have an ethical framework, that there are ethical issues and challenges, and certainly there are things we don't understand as going forward, but at least we have a framework for trying to evaluate them and make decisions, and we'll make wrong decisions sometimes, um, you know, there, there, there are lots of dis decisions about where um, a classified threshold might fall or how you interpret a sort of a, a confusion matrix in terms of what's important. Those, those, but at least there's a framework for making those discussions and, and those decisions. Well, I guess the interesting question is, does the framework cover the issues th that, that are likely to arise? And how, how would we know that it does? findings and what you do with those findings uh, brought to mind that uh, one of the difficulties with ethics is that you can have competing ethical values um, and, and you, you're aiming to I don't know protect confidentiality or um, do your best for the patient uh, and, and those things may come into conflict and, and that's what makes ethics Difficult. <laughs> One thing is recognizing there is an ethical issue, thinking of a solution to that issue, and then realizing that, getting back to AI terms, there's a trade off. <laughs> um, you, you might be able to have one solution that, that then impacts another. I just wanted to throw that thought in. This is a question to the expert panel here, because what I'm hearing, or at least two, two voices that I'm hearing, one is talking about individual, because it's individually we need to make sure that I am ethical and I'm doing things ethical, right? The other thing was 
you talked about more about profession, uh, profession many times from you. And I'm just thinking, is this going to lead us as an industry or as a profession to be more professional, which means getting to a point because of AI and all these technologies coming in that we need to become uh, kind of more regulated or, or, or I wouldn't say not regulated, I would say like doctors be, you know, so it's more a discussion of profession now mm -hmm. and really not about ethics or anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's time now that worldwide, just like the doctors, the accountants, they take, they take oaths, you know, even IT as a profession needs to now become, it's a point now that they have to become a, a regulated profession and every IT professional needs to, or that's all engineering professionals now need to take an Hippocratic oath. So it's more coming to a professional discussion now. I think that that's uh, why it seems very pertinent now. It's also an old discussion. Right? This you can also find this in the 1990s. I think there's probably a case we made that the, the social impact of uh, IT at this point is such that you now that have to, would have to have to be considered. Um, th I would come back to the point I tried to make earlier, namely that this may be one part of this ecosystem that we need. So we have, as individuals, we need to be able to do the right thing. But that requires for us to be structures to be that so that requires laws, that requires professional bodies, that requires all sorts of things, and possibly a Hipp Hippocratic oath or uh, s some other way of, of regulating the profession. Uh, I think these things need to come together, and only then will they make a difference. I've been in favor of regulation for longer than a lot of you have been alive. And, uh, and I, I think the BCS is probably the, the institution to do it. I think we're very keen on the idea of accountability. I think for us, you know, being a professional means you are competent, you're ethical, and you are accountable to a set of standards which we all um, collectively decide on. Um, it sounds like a magic wand to basically say license a practice for, for this kind of an area, and uh, in some senses it could really work. But it won't work unless there is clear agreement on what those standards are that are going to be used to hold people accountable to. And at the moment, we haven't really got those standards around AI and ethics. We're still finding our way. I also wonder whether it might end up going along the same lines as chartered accountancy. You know, there, is, there is no legal requirement to have a chartered accountant, but nobody in the right mind would go near somebody who is an accountant and wasn't chartered. Yeah, and certainly from an exactly. insurance point of view, you would not, <laughs> not <laughs> touch them. And so you wonder whether that might actually be the way it works in practice around AI. That, you know, that in, would in order be to get an excellent sure, yeah, to move forward, yeah. in my opinion. Um, this, this diagram, discussion into this is the job and it seems to me that as long as you take ethical position to be the ethical position of the corporation or the organization in that diagram then what you've got there is the specification for a document that says for this system this is what these are the laws that will apply this is the ethical position that will apply this is the technician this is the technology upon which it's based, and this is, these are the outcomes. And then, if any of those change, you have to go back and look again. For example, if you look legally at health data, as, and, and there is a framework which looks good and works a lot of the time, or some of the time, as far as I know, it's not legal to require the to refrain from, what's the opposite of anonymized? De-anonymized. De 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 that one, <laughs> of being able to identify individuals. Is that right? So I think it's important that anyone who's assessing a, 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 a system yeah. can say, OK, those are the limitations of the laws upon which that system is currently based. And that might lead to other discussions. But at least we know where we stand. So I think all of that needs to be turned into documents that then get implemented. Fundamentally, do you do that through a framework? I mean, we've heard that there's lots of frameworks. Or do you drive that through company culture, where you say everybody's responsible mm -hmm. for 
minimum stance or hip extends here. And you know the limits, what we're trying to achieve here, the guidelines, you don't go beyond that. These are the, these are our values. I Living think you would love to, yeah. It, like I say, that ethical position has to be in effect. The statement of the what, what they call values and principles now, but those need to come all the way down, don't they, into everything you do has to meet that ethical position. But it's the corporation's one. It's individuals might have an ethical position that's not needed. So I think the, the kind of discussions I've, I've, I've heard are around the fact that, yes, you want every single person to take responsibility for the, their contribution to the corporate being ethical, but at the same time, the corporate needs the right governance structure to be able to make sure it can implement the ethical practice. Um, and it's how you split that up between having uh, the right governance that's controlled from above, together with the grassroots, if you like, ethical imperative to actually deliver that on the ground. Thank you, Ben. Someone over here has been waiting a long time. Um, I heard the comments earlier that there are too many uh, ethical standards. Uh, frankly, I believe the way to support industry and keep the development of technology, especially by an institution such as DCF, is to focus on developing guidelines and standards. And there are standards in the making. I myself happen to be blessed to be involved in some. There are 15 ethical technology standards in the making, which are probably about a year from delivery uh, for global application. There's even a certification program for ethical properties such as transparency, accountability, and algorithmic bias, which is almost launched a couple of weeks ago. So the state of play globally is far more advanced than we like to believe. And the essence of it is a kind of independent verification, not leaving it to a big corporation. Of course, those who are enlightened follow ethical principles and develop their own framework, but it is questionable, as you were highlighting, future may not be five Googles to control, maybe hundreds and thousands of SMEs who need assistance, who need training, who need guidelines, and only through voluntary codes such as a standard, not just code of behavior, be decent and uh, don't cheat and that kind of thing. Technology standards on the basis of how to embed human values in your design. Those standards are in the making and I'll be more than happy to share the source yeah. and you can go and access it if you want to. Is there, is there one particular organization or many organizations to go to? The organization which is behind this and it started five years ago making so-called so global social responsibility very seriously is the US IEEE. They already have what's called ethically aligned design, which is thesis on ethical design that they published for free, accessible on IEEE.org. You can go and download it. That's not the kind of thing you can actually go and design against. Together with that, they have also initiated 15 ethical technology ethics standards from consideration of ethics in system design, hardware, software, etc., to facial recognition, to data privacy, etc. And recently they also launched a ethics certification. very 
I completely agree with you. I think the question of liability is, is a key one that needs to be addressed in order to, to move this on. Uh, there has been a recently published uh, high-level expert group opinion uh, from the European Commission around liability in IT. Um, and I think a, a key issue here is that particularly the IT industry has managed very successfully to evade liability forever. And uh, I, I think being able to address that will go a long way to dealing with uh, the exact issue that you addressed, namely the incentives. Why would a company do something differently? Now, five billion may not hurt Facebook terribly, uh, but 50 billion at some point would. Right? So I think it is uh, liability will have to be, will be a key in the ecosystem to be established. Yeah, so this, this is a comment, but on, on that topic, uh, I, I come from an interest background, so I'm not, I'm not an interest witness here. Uh, um, so in, uh, I think there was a conference just a couple of weeks back with the Association of Business Machines with, with the UIMF. And this topic was, and, and we all felt like the internet company taking a big role in terms of behavioral change and getting the corporations to work. Like, we think as insurance companies, we are responsible for that. You know, we need to get that change, but that change is down to more insurance rather than anybody else. So there's a lot of discussion going on in the insurance companies as well. So I'll, I'll hand you the radio. Can I, can I just say about, um, early career programs and so on, you may not be as powerless as you suspect. Um, it, what, what was the Silicon Valley firm that was, that had, its policy was actually changed by a programmer's strike? And certainly if you network and talk to each other, um, you're not complete victims of large corporations. Experience suggests that, you know, if there's enough of you, they will listen. And just in response to that, I'm not going to pretend the BCS can just go marching in and get companies to change the way they operate. What I think the best we can do is to work, uh, what, we, what we call work in partnership with organisations to try and recognise what their culture is like, what the impact of that culture is, to get them to understand the impact it is on actually attracting the kind of people into the company that they would want, um, and then to work with them to identify ways of changing that culture. That's not a quick win, because we are, we are not an all-powerful organisation that can just put our tanks on the lawn and go, you will do what we say or else. It has to be through persuasion and cooperation and collaboration. Um, that's the best the BCS can do. I think that actually is quite a positive force, but it takes time. And it takes a lot of people supporting us and working with us so that you know, we can be seen to be genuinely speaking for the profession. Hi, hi. Yeah, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, my, my view is when, when we talk about ethics in AI, I think the horses have bolted. I mean, we kind of lost the ground, so to speak. I mean, we have autonomous car, all right? We're not going to stop that. We have the light of Tesla coming out to mow AI stuff. So I think what perhaps has uh, a BCS member or a BCS community can do is perhaps raise awareness mm -hmm. you know, of yeah, the impact of, a, of ethics if it's not properly audited in AI, then we can come up with a, a more practical, pragmatic uh, framework. I don't think standard is the way to go, personally, <coughs> from my own personal experience. Uh, the other thing that I, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether anybody is aware of, I mean, there are organizations, you mentioned Turing, Alan Turing Institute, they are heavily involved with ethics and AI mm -hmm. with the ICO and European Union, uh, European Commission. <coughs> I mean, at the beginning of this year, they have already published three papers for public consultation. And I think BCS have a very crucial, important role to play. Instead of coming up with yet more framework, which nobody will read anyway, right? Or 
or organization, they are not going to be interested either. Uh, but that's my strong view. Having worked in big institution and banks, they have their own ethical position to consider to their stakeholders, to their shareholders. So I think that is the challenge with that diagram. Who, who is that? Who is accountable? Nobody is in that context. Right. Right? But in an AI context, it would be different. So I think that is something I think perhaps uh, BCS could play a role to participate more actively in a public consultation with ICO, Alan, uh, yeah, the Alan Turing Institute, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there are three papers currently be in discussion. Mm -hmm. And the talk about liability, they have already explained you know, how do you explain AI. So <coughs> we cannot describe ethics, but they have come up with framework. How do you explain AI ethically? That's my, my view. How, how would you feel about uh, the BCS providing a hotline where an, an individual uh, programmer or a manager could phone up and discuss ethics with the BCS. I'm, I'm putting him on the spot there. I, would, would you think that would be a useful idea? I think it would be. Or you can do, though, is you can go to uh, yeah, this panel, the reading and this panel. Because <laughs> 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 like you've got, you've got a career stability where all cogs in the machine uh, 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 that's yeah. that's quite a defeatist attitude. I mean, it it, uh, it it would be it would be useful to know if companies really are doing unethical things, even if that were in confidence. Um, this this would be useful information, and and there would be times when they were frankly illegal, and that could be pointed out too. Even on the illegal, illegal, all we're required to do is point it out. I'm going back to the code of conduct. The, the, where a black, we'll, we'll, the code of conduct says, as far as I remember, point out to your client the consequences of your action. That's it. And, well, again, there's limits to what BCS can do, but, yeah. I, I, but I think it could support people in the profession, on the ground, who want to be ethical. It's just an, an obvious support mechanism that it could offer. Um, just on your hand subject of BCS code of conduct, uh, um, the, uh, it is that uh, the, the IT professional should know the laws that are relevant in the area that they're working and abide by them. So. Well, you can abide by them by not doing what we've been asked to do, by saying, I'm not going to do that for you, I'm not going to implement that particular system for you because But when it comes uh, when it comes to the law and and uh, AI and using AI, um, that if there is something in that system that is um, not compliant with the law in some way, I have an idea it would come to light because of the data result or, or something. So. Uh, Shall I leave you with that to ponder on the way home? <laughs> <laughs> and you can, you can challenge me uh, on it. And I don't want to be despondent. What I want us to be is honest hmm. about what we can do right now. And then we can look at how could we do more. C can I sure. quickly butt in here? Um, the question here seems to be who has agency? The BCS, you as an employee, we as a, a society. Two examples. One, Google Project Maven. Uh, Google, um, th this was an application of Google technology to military app, uh, for, for military purposes. Google uh, coders said, no, we don't want, want it. They st stood up to the company and said, no, this is against what we've signed up to. Company backed down. Google yeah. said, okay, we're not going to do this. Counter example, <laughs> Microsoft HoloLens. Same story. HoloLens is this, this uh, virtual reality thing, which they then wanted to sell to the US Army. Uh, the, the developer said, no, we don't want this. Uh, CEO said, shut up, we're doing it anyway. Uh, what I, th the, I think the, the message here is uh, that it's not obvious that who has agency and how it's going to play out. In the case of uh, Google uh, Project Maven, there was a reference used by the employees to the ACM, not the BCS, but this is America, 
who used the code of conduct of the ACM to support their claim that this is not what they signed up to. Yeah. And that was part of the argument which actually won the day in the end. So I think professional bodies do have a role. They can't solve everything, but we have agency, professional bodies have agency, and I think that's the way we need to uh, go about this. Can I? So that's a really example, because actually I've talked to fellows in the BCS, some of whom have said actually that was the wrong decision, and some of whom have said actually that was the right decision. And they've said that actually ethically, um, a country should have the technology it needs in order to defend itself, which should be the best <laughs> technology available. Um, I've heard legal experts tell me that uh, actually, do you know what happens in wars? Humans get scared and angry and go around killing people at random. And maybe machines wouldn't get scared and angry and kill people at random. <laughs> so it's not as clear cut. So I've had, I've had arguments from both sides. So actually, the BCS right now can't say there is a consensus of opinion within the profession on one of those decisions. Because in fact, the profession doesn't agree with itself about which of those two would have been what, what they would call ethical. And I can, I can, I can kind of sympathize with both sides of that argument just as an, as an individual, you know? Um, so. um, I'm no one ever said ethics was easy. <laughs> Stop here. That was it. Yeah. yeah. But it is uh, interesting. Flay <laughs> Flay has just finished with more or less what I was going to say. <laughs> so uh, leaving you all in that uh, in that dilemma um, of the hard task ahead of you, <laughs> being ethical. Um, Thank you very much, Penny, and thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very at least thought provoking. Um, uh, hour and a half, no, longer than that, oh my God, is it really five hours? <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I know that religion and politics are two subjects we certainly shouldn't talk about with a whole load of people, or maybe we should add ethics, morality, and legal things to that list, but open it up as a list that we should talk about. And I personally feel that the BCS is an ideal forum to discuss and open up these issues, bring out the thoughts from our learned minds, of which we have plenty, not, not, not right here, but all around here, um, and we can produce documents, we can produce thoughts that will produce change, and I think we should, don't you?